I was nine years old in 1943, and there was a war going on. And we were all concerned. The war was still in doubt. I mean, it was something that could still be lost. The idea of the United States losing a war when we never had lost a war was uh, unthinkable to all of us. But nevertheless, there was concern. I know that during those years there was a great deal more attention given to prayer, that a lot more people went to church than went to church at other times and times had gone before them, because the truth is that, that the moral decay that goes on around us in our country has been going on for a long time. But when the war comes along, people become concerned. They make promises to God, and they carry out those promises. They, they got a boy overseas, they pray every day, sometimes several times a day, and they say, Lord, if you'll just bring my boy home, I will. And so righteousness begins to infect the people, as it were, in a time of war. It's a funny thing, you know. I don't think it was a coincidence that it was just immediately after World War I that we ended on the great experiment of prohibition in this country. So many millions of our boys had been killed, and I'm sure a lot of preachers had, had pulled scriptures out of the prophets and talked about how God had been angry with us and how we needed to clean up our lives. And demon rum was causing a, you know, a great deal of trouble, so let's just outlaw it. And so from 1919 to 1933 in this country, we outlawed alcoholic beverages. I don't think it's a coincidence that came about right at the end of the war. Along came World War II, and there were prayers in school every day. I don't know if that was true all across the country, but it was most places. And that, in the place where my wife went to school, she could recall that there was prayers every morning at school at 10 o'clock when they stopped to pray for our servicemen who were overseas. And even when the Gulf War came along, we had a mild fit of righteousness there, didn't we? We, we had a national day of prayer. People took it seriously. There was a great deal of prayer. Prayers were offered up. And frankly, looking at the way the Gulf War worked out, it worked. The prayers were heard. The prayers were answered. Wars are times when people really, spiritually speaking, pull up their socks. But when the crisis is past, people forget God soon enough. It's not new. You find examples of it over and over again throughout the Judges. You find it through the prophets in the history of Israel. And you can watch our own history, and it's as clear as anyone could ever see it there. We find our way back to the road to ruin about as quickly as we found our way off of it. But there is hope. There is hope, even so. Last week, in a sermon I think that we, we entitled, We Have Sinned, I talked a little bit about how we have gotten to where we are and where we're going. This week I want to talk about an obscure little scripture that maybe that has been spoken of many times, but I don't know if we fully understood before. There is hope. The scripture is in Romans, the ninth chapter. Romans chapter 9, and I'll begin reading in verse 27. Paul is in the middle of a, a lengthy discussion about Israel and the salvation of Israel and why it is that the Jews aren't believing the gospel and Christians are. I mean, those Gentiles are. Isaiah also cries, verse 27, concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord, Lord make upon the earth. What in the world does that mean? How, how do you understand that scripture? He will finish the work and he will cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. There's an interesting little, uh, not exactly parallel, but use of the same phrase about cutting something short. Back in 2 Kings, and I'll begin reading here in uh, chapter 10, verse 30. Now, Jehu was a, was a warrior. He was not in a kingly line, but God commissioned him to carry out certain rather bloody tasks in the clearing up of the house, cleaning out of the house of Ahab and the cleaning out of Baal worship in Israel, which... Jehu did it. He did it with incredible zeal. And in verse 30 of 2 Kings, God said to Jehu, Because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes, and you have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now, we are talking about the throne of northern Israel, not Jerusalem. We're talking about the throne that was in Samaria. But, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, of the God of Israel, with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. That in itself is a long enough story. 
that they actually abandoned the worship of God, they abandoned the holy days, they abandoned going to Jerusalem for the holy days, and established new centers of worship in the north and put up golden calves up there. And in all the, 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 the history, the 200-odd year history of the northern tribes, they never ever went away from that particular sin. So although God said, you've done well, and I'm going to bless you, and your children are going to sit on the throne, Jehu did not listen to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam who made Israel to sin. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Hazael smote them in the coast of Israel. Hazael was a, a king of Syria. God began to cut them short. Now, that's an interesting phrase, as I said, and, and, and here Paul is in Romans using the thing that, that the Lord will finish the work, but he will cut it short and be justified to do so, as he said. He'll cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. What does that mean? And looking back at this, the occasion where God began to cut Israel short, why was he doing it? I mean, what, what do you mean by it, and why are you doing it, is the question that one might want to ask here. There is one more verse that should be taken in verse 29 of Romans 9. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have been like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. Now, this passage of Scripture is cited from the 10th chapter of Isaiah. So as long as that, that, that uh, Paul is quoting him, as long as we're trying to understand what it's all about, let's turn back there. The King James Version translation of Isaiah 10 is a little bit difficult, and you'll begin to realize as you read through here that the translation that Paul was working from differs somewhat from our translation. But I think it's fair enough to say that Paul had the idea that what, uh, of what Isaiah is trying to say. Isaiah, the 10th chapter, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. For though your people Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Now, there's nothing like that in the statement that Paul made over in Romans, is there? He says that Isaiah cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. He uses the word saved. Uh, Isaiah uses the word return. Then he says, He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah says at this point, The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness, or God will cut it short in righteousness. The translation that they've chosen here on the consumption decreed is awkward, and I, I, I don't know how accurate the King James translators are. But it's plain that what Paul is saying is that the sense behind this is that there will be a remnant of Israel saved because God is going to complete or finish off or cut off his work in time. For the Lord of hosts shall make a consumption even determined. Odd, isn't it? A consumption determined. Basically, it is, he is determined to finish something in the midst of all the land. Paul, again, makes his point that God will finish the work and will cut it short in righteousness because the short work he will make upon the earth. Now, the key to understanding what he is saying here is the word remnant. What he is saying is that though the, the, the children of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, and that even though they are going to be going into captivity, and once we, we make that statement, we need to stop for just a moment and ask ourselves, okay, why? Well, last week I went through some of that as I read through some of the depravity that God warned Israel against and through some of the scriptures that talked about the depravity into which Israel had gone with the incredible corruption of their society. Well, because of that corruption and because of that decay, God stepped in and cut them short. He took them into captivity. He punished them for what they were doing, one might say. But the truth is that God's intervention God's chastisement, God's grasping of Israel by the scruff of the neck and shaking them till their teeth rattle, is the only thing that makes possible the salvation of a remnant. Otherwise, he said, they would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you read what Paul said there? He said that he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. As Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have been like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. Our society would have rotted away until if you reached down to try to pick it up like a stick, the thing would have collapsed in your fingers and run out like so much dust. 
it would have finally been burnt, like Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt. The cutting short, then, is the thing that preserves the remnant, that if God did not step in and cut us short, we would eventually go the same route. It takes a war. It takes a crisis. It takes a loss for us to even begin to start thinking, where have we gone wrong? How have we sinned? What have we done? Why is God doing this to us? Most of us, even individually, much less as a nation, have figured out long ago how to stay in trouble. We have learned that when we, when we are in trouble, when our life is hurting and when we are in pain, we, we learn how to pray and we pray effectively. And when things go well in our lives, we forget God. So God lets you get into trouble again, and you pray, and you seek God, and you put your life right again, and you're out of trouble. And as soon as you're out of trouble, you forget God. It's the way human beings are. We serve God better when we're in pain than we do when we're in prosperity. So that's the formula, I guess. God's not, you know, he can figure that out. The best thing he can do for us, then, is pain. And so it works out that way. Now, one thing that is interesting about this passage back here in Isaiah, the 10th chapter, as he's talking about all these things about the remnant shall return, he continues down talking about the captivity that they were going to be going into with the Assyrians, the remainder of the 10th chapter, and then without even so much as a transition, he says in verse chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. These are prophecies of the Messiah. That the Messiah is going to come. He will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He'll slay the wickedness. And then it says in verse 6, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion the fattening together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The sucking child shall play on the hole of the snake, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt, they shall not destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. So this cutting short takes place just before the return of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God. The only way we will ever have peace, the only way we can ever have peace with righteousness, is to go through this period of time that's just ahead of us now. The, the chastisement, War and captivity, followed by the return of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now back in, in Romans again, take a look at that 29th verse that talks about, unless God had left us a remnant, we would have wound up like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, now then, that, that particular passage is a citation from the first chapter of Isaiah. And so to understand that, we'll go back to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Why? God asked through Isaiah, would you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Here you are. You know, you're supposed to be God's people. And I've chastised you. I've brought the heathen upon you. Your sons have gone up into battle and have died. You're sick. You're dying of cancers and consumptions and various diseases. You are stricken and sick, and you still don't repent. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness but wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. You know, you, they have not been closed, nor bound up, nor mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. As for your land, same strangers devoured in your presence. It's desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. The imagery is of here's this little lodge right in the middle of the garden. All around it are plants. Jerusalem is just this walled city in the middle of armies and armies of people who have besieged it all around on every side. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we would have been like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. What he is saying is, if 
the days are shortened, there will be a remnant. If God had not somehow managed to keep that remnant, we would have gone all the way to that. Israel will not be allowed to rot completely away. God will actually intervene while they still can repent. You know, there comes a time in, in, in a person's life where they do go beyond the pale, where they are beyond repentance, where they are beyond turning back. One of the Proverbs says, He who being often reproved hardens his neck shall in the end be suddenly destroyed and that without remedy. The Bible tells us that repentance is a gift from God. It tells us that you can go so far down a road to where that gift, that option of repentance, is withdrawn. It does not last forever. What this passage of Scripture is telling you, and what Romans 9 is telling you is, that God is going to cut short the time so that there will still be room for us to repent. If he didn't, we wouldn't. Listen to the first chapter again, verse 16 of Isaiah. Wash, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before your eyes, or from not my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come, let's reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You know, this is just a simple, sweet call for repentance. Come on. Let's reason together. You don't have to go this way. You don't have to live the lifestyle you're living. But you can actually put away the evil of your doing. Instead of oppressing people, you can start taking care of people. Listen to the continuance in verse 21. How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lived in it. Now, murderers. Your silver is gross. Your wine is mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everybody loves gifts. Everybody goes after reward. It is the decade of greed, as it has been called. And I talked about that in a sermon last week, about the degree to which we have been corrupted in business and in politics. Everybody is after whatever they can get out of the system. You know what's interesting, though, about this passage? This chapter is also followed by the millennium. There is this warning. There is this statement, unless God had left us a remnant, there was no way that we would ever turn back. There's no way we would ever know God. And yet the way of repentance is held out to us. He says, come on now, let's reason together, let's turn this around so there is going to be a remnant. Chapter 2, it says, and it shall come to pass in the last day that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall go and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations, he shall rebuke many people, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. There is a time coming when this, you know, when men will stop war. There is a time coming when the, when the rot and the decay will cease. But it's going to cease because God decides to cut the work short or to complete the work early rather than allowing the thing to just drift and go until finally it rots away until there is nothing left. Now, a question that's worth asking about this is how long, how soon, where are you, where are we relative to this type of thing? Now turn back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 6, a fascinating little passage right in the middle of his prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 6, and I want to begin reading verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they can listen? I mean, I, you wonder sometimes, you know, you preach, you preach, you preach. Mr. Armstrong goes on television and, and, and puts the message out. Who are we going to speak to to give a warning that they might hear? Look, their, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot listen. The word of the Lord is unto them as a reproach. They have no delight in it. Now, that's a, an apt description of our day-to-day. -day. 
I mean, are you going to get on television and quote the Bible to people about, about sex and sexual sin? I mean, what happened when the Vice President of the United States criticized one of the television programs for upholding a certain lifestyle? You know, it made him look absolutely ridiculous. If he'd quoted the Bible, they'd have probably tried to make him look even worse. The truth is that people, by and large, they don't want to know about God's Word. The Word of the Lord is a reproach to them, and it certainly is that. It reproaches them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even with the husband, with the wife shall be taken, the old men with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned to others, with their fields and their wives together, because I am going to stretch out my hand with the inhabitants of the land. For from the least of them to the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. From the prophet to the priest, every one deals falsely. I mean, you are looking for a great political leader, all the way from from the president of the country all the way down to the lowest cabinet member or the lowest member of government or all the way to the head of a major corporation down to the worker in the streets or all the way to the head of the large religions to the, to the local preacher somewhere. All of them deal falsely. They have healed also the daughter, the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there was no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time I visit them they shall be cast down, saith the Lord." You know, as long as it's possible for us to be ashamed of our sins, there is room for repentance. You know, you, it isn't that we're not all sinners. It, it isn't that one of us can point the finger at another and say, see what you did. Because the Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is, is, is a great evil. Sin destroys our lives. Sin hurts us. But we can repent of sin. The problem is that when we no longer feel shame, when we no longer blush at the things that take place before our eyes, we are getting to the place to where it's no longer possible to repent. And that is the real danger point. They were not ashamed when they committed sin, neither could they blush. You do understand, don't you, that when all those prophecies about Israel and that the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Joel, Amos, and Obadiah, and all these people were prophesying about how that Israel was going into captivity, the entire object of the whole thing, the reason why it was going to happen, was not merely to punish Israel for what they had done but was to lead Israel to repentance. What can you do when repentance is no longer possible? Perhaps it would be wise to cut short the time, to cut a people short before they get to the place to where they are no longer able to repent. When they get to where they are no longer ashamed, when they are getting to the place to where they don't blush at sin anymore, when sin is no big deal to them anymore. Maybe it is time to cut things short while they still have the possibility, at least, of being able to repent. Were they ashamed? No. They weren't. Did they blush? No, they, they couldn't even blush. You know, if you look at our society today from that perspective, I'd have to say we're running short of, 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 of hope. The room for repentance is getting narrower all the time. The capacity for being able to turn it around. You know, turning around takes some space. Oftentimes, if you're trying to turn a jet airliner around, it takes a pretty good wide area of sky, several miles of sky, to turn one of those things around. An ocean liner takes a lot of room to turn around. And there comes a place in the life where you have, a mo have so much momentum and where you are so focused that there, that there just isn't room anymore for a person to turn around. Now, that's not you. I, you wouldn't bother being here today. But the fact is, there is a place out there where you can't make the turn. We as a people have to face the fact there is a place out there where we as a nation will no longer be able to make the turn. We sort of turned it in World War II. We sort of turned it in World War I. We made a little uh, lurch at it in the Gulf War. It might have been better for us as a people to have lost that war. 
been humiliated by that war and had a lot of young men killed by that war. Maybe. But here's the warning that there is that need for the ability to be able to, 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 to turn around. Isaiah 3 and verse 9. The show of their countenance witnesses against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe to their soul, for they have rewarded evil to themselves. Say you to the righteous, it shall be well with him, they will eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands will be given to him. They declare their sin like Sodom. They don't hide it. Isaiah is preoccupied with this, this question of Sodom. He started out his, his book with it. He comes, continues with it here, and the, the very idea. He even compares the rulers of Israel to Sodom and Gomorrah and addresses them as Sodom and Gomorrah in, one of the, in, in the first chapter of his prophecy. And he says, if you get to the place to where you're like Sodom, when, when the two angels of God came into the city of Sodom to see whether what they had been told about the city was true, you remember the story? They came by the house of Lot, and Lot received them into his home. And the men of the city came and beat upon the door of the house and said, Send these men out here, that we may carnally know them. Well, everybody understands what the passage is all about. What those men had in mind was homosexual rape. And it wasn't something they were going to do in the dark. It wasn't something they were going to do in the corner. They weren't going to waylay these guys along the roadside somewhere. They were going to do it right out there in front of them, God, and on everybody. The sodomites no longer kept their sin in the closet. They no longer kept it in the bedroom. They no longer even kept it in the back alley. It was accepted. It was, quote, normal behavior in that area. You know, in the Bible, there is a curious distinction between the word Sodom and sodomite. Sodom, the word in Hebrew, Sodom, simply means burnt. Now, that's not hard to figure out how the name Sodom came about, is it? Seems likely that Sodom... Uh, may have had a different name before it was burnt, but, but ever after it was known as as Sodom or burnt. Now, as you go through the stories in the Book of Kings, they will talk about the Sodomites. That is an utterly unrelated word in Hebrew, and it's unfortunate that they that they translated it Sodomite because it has no relationship to the word the Hebrew word for burnt at all. All it means is male prostitute. It was a a, a collection of homosexuals who had a house hard by the temple who engaged in male prostitution as a routine matter. As I say, it's a, it's a curious distinction that was made. In the Old Testament, a homosexual was just another garden variety of sinner. You know, they, they, they were just like fornicators. They were just like adulterers. I mean, you, if you're a homosexual, you're a sinner. If you're a fornicator, you're a sinner. The fact of the matter is that, so that, that we have come to the place now to where we, when, when somebody tries to tell us that, well, homosexuality is no worse than fornication, well, that's an immediate thing. It just shows how far we've come that we don't consider fornication to be all that big a deal anymore, whereas in God's eyes, it's just as bad as homosexuality. A homosexuality, as I say, was just another garden variety of sinner. A sodomite, however, was something else instead. A sodomite corresponded a lot more to the promiscuous, cruising gay who hangs out in bathhouses and gay bars and so forth and manages to have relationships with 365 men in the course of a year. That's what, you know, the Bible uses the term sodomite. This is the class of sinner that it's talking about as opposed to a homosexual, as we would use the term today. There is a tendency among Christian people to sing out, single out homosexuality as the worst of sexual sin. And you can't imagine the pressure that puts on the, the, the few, not that many, but there are some gay people who are actually members of the Church of God International. I say gay. I mean, there are people who have homosexual tendencies or have a homosexual past. But homosexuals can repent. They have repented, and they put that out of their lives. The problem is, in this sense, with, with people who have a tendency or have made bad choices in the past and have subsequently repented of those choices. They are, as I say, no worse sinners than the fornicators among us who repented of our fornication. Biblically, Homosexual, homosexual sins are just another kind of sin. Churches have, have long accepted repentant homosexuals just like they have accepted uh, repentant fornicators. And that's true of God's church. It's true of the Worldwide Church of God. It's true of the Church of God International and many others as well. Sociologically, however, and I'm talking about society as, at large, it is another matter. Homosexuality is or has been perceived 
as worse in our society and in societies at large over the years than has fornication or adultery. It has been mainly this, this way mainly because of the sodomites in our society, not because of the homosexuals in our society. As a consequence of this, homosexuality is the last of this type of sin to be normalized. Think about it. It's the last one to be normalized because in society at large it is thought of as the worst of the lot. Now, sin is one thing. The normalization of sin is another. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sin is one thing. You, when you commit sin, you know, you take your date out to, you know, on, on Lover's Lane somewhere and the two of you get carried away and you commit fornication, you have sinned. And to the degree that you are able to be ashamed of yourself and repent of it and know that you did wrong and come back, all you are, as I said earlier, is just the old garden variety of sinner. But when we take a step beyond this and we legitimize or normalize that type of conduct, and we say that a person who, who is living in sin, as it were, is not any different from a person who is living righteously, that they are normal, we have made a very large step as a people. It is one thing not to condemn a sinner. It is another thing to normalize sin. When we normalize sodomy, homosexuality, we have managed to get ourselves very, very near to the end of the line. It is not the sodomy. It is not the homosexuality that's the problem. It's the fact that we as a people have come to the place to where we are ready to break down one of the very last barriers that we as a society have had between us and certain types of behavior. Oh, the behavior has been there all along. But it's been sin. It needed to be repented of. We could be ashamed of it. We could blush at it. But we are coming to the place to where it is no longer to be considered sin. Ah, what a, what a, what a word. You know, if you stand up and say something is a sin in today's world, they think, huh, you know, he said it was a sin as though that uh, you're, you're a fool. You're an idiot. In fact, I find myself sometimes when I'm giving a sermon or talking about it as I did last week, in order to, to not, not be able to use that word to call it immoral conduct, because at least people understand when I say immorality what I'm talking about. But when I say sin, you know, it almost gets to the place to where there isn't any sin anymore. And when you get to the place to where you no longer can recognize sin as sin, how far are you as a society, as a people, as a person, from the end of the road? At what point would God need to step into your life and jerk you up short or cut you short? Turn back, if you would, to Romans, the first chapter. Again, the sermon is not so much about homosexuality, not about that at all. It's about the fact of what we are prepared to normalize. We have long since normalized fornication. We have long since normalized adultery. We've not long since normalized a whole long list of sins that people might commit. Now we are getting down to, the, to a different place. What is the cause of homosexual behavior? You know, that's been something that, uh, you know, ever been, people have been thinking about it a great deal and talking about it a great deal because of what's going on in the government right now with the decision to allow gays into the military. Why, how do they get that way? Why are they that way? Well, whatever you may believe, the Apostle Paul reveals the cause, the underlying cause of it, in the first chapter of Romans. I'll begin reading in verse 18, Romans 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, I'm not talking, he's not talking about any particular sin. He's talking about all kinds of sin. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, but singularly because of the fact that they suppress the truth in the process. Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them. God has shown it to them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, is his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They weren't thankful. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What had they done? They had forsaken God. They have turned their back on God. This is the cause. What is the effect? Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And of course, when a man goes, goes out and takes another man's wife out for the evening and goes to bed with another man's wife, they have dishonored their bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. That's what they did. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And all you've got to do nowadays is suggest that homosexuality is unnatural behavior and uh, you're laughed out of court. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the word woman, burned in their lust one to another, men with men working what is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was natural, which would come. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, he's just mentioned one of the things which are not convenient, only one, homosexuality. But he's not through being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, people who break their covenant, their contract isn't worth the paper it's written on, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same in them, but have pleasure in them that do them. It's awful, isn't it? It's rotten. Now, you know, he says, now don't, he said, they know the judgment of God that they that commit such things are worthy of death. Now, do we all understand that? Are you prepared to agree today with Paul that people who do things, this list of things here, are worthy of death? You are, aren't you? Okay. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever judges. If you judge that, you're without excuse. Because wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, because you that judge do the same things. Now look back at the list again. And if you don't find yourself somewhere in that list, you're not being honest with yourself. Proud? That's easy enough. Disobedient to parents? Uh, you know, inventors of evil things, maybe uh, broken your word or been a covenant breaker along the way. In our age, I'm afraid an awful lot of us are lacking in natural affection because of what we've been through in our lives and been hardened by. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against those that commit such things. And do you think, O man, that judges them that do such things and do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? And so it is that we can point our finger at all the sinners around us in the world, but the fact of the matter is that our world, our society, except maybe for a, the 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal somewhere out there, that our society as a whole have turned their back on God. They have not wanted to retain God in their knowledge. The words of God, the writings of God, the things that tell a person how to live are, are a reproach to them. They don't care about them. They don't want to hear them. They don't want to have anything to do with them. And they're without excuse because the evidence of God is around them on every side, and the evidence of what is right and proper in the, in the conduct of human behavior. They have no excuse. And because they have forsaken God, the result of it is this incredible litany of sins. And the homosexuals whom we perceive to be among the worst of the lot really aren't. They're just... Well, some more of a bad lot, but there is one thing about them. They are about the last of all the sinners that we are willing to legitimize. 
And when we come to the place to where we're willing to legitimize there, and we might as well, if we're going to be honest about everything in our society, why, why wring our hands over that? We've been willing to legitimize everything else, but know this. Somewhere between here and the point of no return, God will finish the work and cut it short. And it's really kind of up to every one of us to think about where we're going to be standing or what we're going to be doing when that time comes. Back in Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew, chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said to them, You see these things? I want you to understand something. There's going to be a time coming when there's not one stone here left upon, upon another that shall not be thrown down. Well, they wandered on down across Kidron and out to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Ah, the end of the age, the return of Christ. When is he going to come back, and what is he going to do when he comes back, and how are we going to know that it's coming down upon us? Jesus lists a lot of things that will begin to take place in society at large. At verse 14, though, he makes an, an interesting statement. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. The Bible has gone nearly everywhere. Now, we have not gone nearly everywhere well preaching it, but we've acknowledged a long time ago that we're not the only people who ever proclaim the gospel somewhere. But the Bible has gone nearly everywhere. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in a holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child, and woe to them that give suck in those days. But pray you that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day, because then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. You might read, for the remnant's sake, those days will be shortened. Not because the remnant are good enough that they deserve it, the days will be shortened so that there will be a remnant, so that there will be some people who can still repent, because the time could come, and one should expect it to be so, when there would be no one left, no flesh left. You know, the clear implication of the Bible is that left to ourselves, left to ourselves, we would finally decay and rot away to where we were absolutely and totally irredeemable and worthless, and our planet good for nothing except to be destroyed with us with it. The promise is, the hope is, and I used to kind of ponder about this because I would read the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, knowing what went on there, and I would read some of the prophecies, and I would look around at our society and say, well, we're bad. And we're not that bad. And we apparently have got a long way to go before some of this stuff comes to pass, but one day I suddenly woke up and realized, no. God isn't going to let us run all the way out to the end of this rope. He is not going to allow us to go as far as Somalia has gone. He's not going to allow us to go as far down as some other nations of this world have gone. There will be a remnant that will be left. He will specifically not allow us to go as far as Sodom and Gomorrah went. I have no idea how long we got. Later in the same thing, Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree. You see, when his branch is tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So likewise you, when you see all these things, know it's near, even at the doors. There are things going on around you all the time that if you'll just pay attention, you will know what it means, and you will know what it's coming. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord does come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. 
I guess one of the most encouraging things I heard some, anyone say in a long time was recently where someone said, well, you know, it looks to me like we could easily have 50 years left. Do you have any idea where we as a people could be in 50 years from now? Do you see on the, on the horizon as the way we are as a people and the way we are going as a society any likelihood that we're going to be any stronger morally, uh, any better in character, any closer to God, any closer to godly ways in 50 years than we are today? Or does it look to you like maybe we're going the other way? Frankly, with the abolition of prayer from schools, with the introduction of certain of the classes into schools, which we may be able to fend off for a little while, but we will not ultimately be able to stop, with the changes in the approach of what are being taught to our children, with the changes that are, that are coming about steadily on what's going to be on television, what's going to be in the movies, and what's going to be in our newspapers and our novels and everything else, 50 years at the rate of change in this world is an eternity. But I have good news. God will finish the work in righteousness, but he'll cut it short. For a short work, the Lord will make upon the earth. 